So I'd like to introduce the panel lead, Captain James Carolyn, as a panel moderator and has extensive cyberspace operations experience over the course of his career, including assignments with Naval Network Warfare Command, Fleet Cyber Command, U.S. Cyber Command, and the National Security Agency. Captain Carolyn currently serves as the chair, Cyber Science Department at the United States Naval Academy, and is also an adjunct associate professor at the University of Maryland Global Campus, and also serves on the editorial board of the US Naval Institute, and also on the editorial board of our own Cyber Magazine. He was instrumental in getting Cyber Magazine, uh, the Cyber Journal, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, Momentum. And thank you very much for doing that. Sir, the floor is yours. All right, good morning, everyone. There you go. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, excited to be here for this panel. I think we got a really good group of panelists here. Um, we've got panelists who were the uh, very first in their cyber career field. We've got panelists who are the most senior officer in their cyber career field. We've got panelists who are uh, the community managers or have been the community managers for the cyber career fields for their service. Obviously, we have every service represented here. We have uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, and Space Force uh, here to talk about the cyber career fields for their particular services. Uh, before I actually introduce them, just kind of how we'll run the panel is uh, I'll start off with the uh, first question for each of the, the panelists to really talk about kind of the current state of their cyber career fields, uh, further services. And then from that point forth, um, you guys, we can make this interactive. If you have questions as we go, just raise your hand uh, and I will call on you. Um, but otherwise, we've got more questions that we'll, we'll pose to the, to the panelists and we'll see where the conversation takes us. Sound good? Question already? <laughs> Okay, all right, so let me tell you what we have here. Uh, so starting uh, from my far left here, we've got Commander Michael Chin. He's currently the Cyber Strategy Division Chief at the Coast Guard Headquarters Office of Cyberspace Forces. His team recently hosted the Global Marine Transportation System Cybersecurity Symposium in California with a diverse group of professionals and international partners from 15 countries. His prior assignment was at US Cyber Command serving in the J-33 leading and managing daily activities of the Joint Operations Center. He served in various C5ISR-related assignments. Next, we have uh, Colonel Joe Wingo. He's the Chief of Cyber and Spectrum Operations for Headquarters US, Cyber, U.S. Space Force. His division leads planning and policy development for Space Force cybersecurity, cyber operations, electronic warfare, spectrum management, and satellite communications. Colonel Wingo has graduated from multiple command tours who include command of the Air Force's Cyber Warfare and Information Operations Schoolhouse, the 39th IOS. Additionally, he has served as the Air Force's Cyber Career Field Manager. Next to him, we have Lieutenant Colonel Todd Arnold, who's a research scientist and team lead at the Army Cyber Institute and is an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at West Point. He earned a PhD in Electrical Engineering from Columbia University, where he focused on internet routing and networking. His first 10 years in the Army were spent working network engineering positions with multiple deployments to Iraq. And during the past 10, he has worked in both offensive and, def and defensive cyberspace operations positions. He was instrumental in the establishment and design of the Army Cyber Branch and subsequently the Army Developers MOS having served as the Army's first lead developer. Next, we have Lieutenant Colonel Tony Siciliano. He's currently the Deputy Assistant Chief of Staff, G9, for Marine Corps Forces Cyber Command. Over his 30-year career, he has worked in the operational communications, special operations, network engineering, and cyber operations fields. Over the past six years, he served in a number of Cyber Mission Force work, work roles, to include command of a combat support team. This summer, he'll transfer to headquarters in Marine Corps, where he will lead the Readiness Branch Information Maneuver Division, Deputy Commandant for Information. Next, we have Colonel Carlos Alford uh, as the Commander, 89th Airlift Support Group, Joint Base Andrews, Maryland. He leads 336 military personnel and civilians providing executive airborne communications and mission defense for four different operational support airlift aircraft to the President, Vice President, and many other senior leaders. Colonel Alford was commissioned 
through ROTC uh, at Valdosta State University. He's a two-time squadron commander who has served various leadership positions in the communications and cyber systems career field, including U.S. Cyber Command J-53 and is a former cyber warfare operations career field manager. And lastly, we have Captain Will Terrell, who's the division chief for cyber electromagnetic spectrum operations and operations in the information environment within the Joint Staff J-5 strategy plans and policy. He's a cryptologic warfare officer and member of the Navy Space Cadre with cyber SIG and electronic warfare experience afloat and ashore. Prior to his assignment on the Joint Staff, Captain Terrell was the head information warfare community manager at the Bureau of Naval Personnel, where he was responsible for the cryptologic warfare, cyber warfare engineer and cyber warrant officer communities. Okay, so as you can see, we have a lot of good experience here in front of you. So let's get started. So first question uh, for everyone, and we'll just start to my left here with Commander Chen, is we've seen a lot happening in recent years regarding cyber career field changes in the services. Please tell us how officer and enlisted cyber career fields have evolved in your service and the current state of those career fields. Sure, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and represent the Coast Guard. I do have some notes so I can make sure my numbers are correct as, as of last year anyway. So um, a, few, a few things that we've done for the cyber workforce. Um, I am in the career and I've also helped manage the, the uh, work, work career workforce, uh, working with our Office of Personnel Management. But um, many years ago, the Coast Guard looked into the state of the C4 IT workforce and really determined that we need to restructure. Right, so looking at what's out there, you know, you, uh, Coast Guard Cyber Command stood up and we really wanted to align our workforce to the NICE framework. And then, you know, having that alignment with the DOD uh, Cyber Workforce Framework uh, and subsequent Cyber Officer uh, Specialty Code and the subspecialty codes. So we set that up for the officer career path. But some of the issues that we ran into, similar to what Sergeant Major covered in the last presentation was really retention and trying to fill the billets with those officer specialty codes. Uh, some of the numbers I wanted to share is, you know, our data from our HR office shows a 9% vacancy, vacancy rate across the cyber community uh, combined with an underfill rate of 28% across all ranks. So we're looking at in the 01 to 04 pay grade, 275 out of the 294 billets are filled. And that number is kind of staggering because 34, 32% of those billets were actually staffed by members of a lower pay grade and then with over 68% filled lacking the cyber specialty code. So we're having to make do with a, a lot less than we are uh, trying to line ourselves up for. And then on the enlisted side, um, our vice commandant and soon to be commandant, uh, Admiral Linda Fagan, actually recently approved the cyber mission specialist rating. All right, so that's a huge win for our workforce. Um, being able to um, not have to go through the special assignments process that they've gone through during the past three or four assignment cycles and being able to finally have a rating stood up so that they can stay within the community and go through the training and gain the uh, experience required to be on the CPT, CMT, the red and blue team is gonna be very important for us. So we're, my team's really excited to try and work through the implementation and hopefully have a you know, 300 plus uh, cyber mission specialist workforce working in CG cyber uh, with their peers across the uh, CMF. Uh, hopefully that answered the question for now. Yeah, so uh, Space Force has, uh, we talk about evolving. Um, it's a little bit different because we just stood up, right? So we don't necessarily have to evolve from the way the Space Force used to be to where the Space Force is or to where we want to be, uh, it's really kind of more about trying to figure out how we want to be different from our roots in the Air Force and what we need to do. And so we were very fortunate that our leadership from the four star uh, down was very much a believer in cyber defense. Um, General Whiting, who's the, the SPOC three star, the, the, our Space Operations Command, uh, Field Command three star, used to, when he was part of AF Space, owned the, back when AF Space owned cyber for the Air Force, that he was, uh, running that and, and very involved with the CMF. And so he's a big believer. Uh, my boss, General Saltzman, big believer, uh, General Thompson, General Raymond. So as part of the, as part of the pad that stood up the Space Force, we were tasked to not do IT. Um, IT was supposed to be left with the Air Force and we we're supposed to focus in our, our, our guardians on cyber mission defense. 
for the Space Force specifically. And so really what we've been focused on is, okay, we have that charter, uh, how do we go about executing it? And, uh, and they've largely given us a blank slate in terms of how we want to set up and, and run the career field accordingly or the career fields accordingly. And so we've tried to take a lot of liberty with that blank slate. Um, right now we're kind of in the, we're in the middle of that shift. Uh, there was a lot of uh, enterprise IT as a service. If you're familiar with that for the Air Force, we're you know, taking the enterprise IT uh, work and commoditizing that lock, stock and barrel done as a service type of function uh, was supposed to give a return of our IT professionals and those billets so we could transition them to cyber defense. Uh, that's moving slower than expected. And so we've been basically cracking the, uh, try, trying to figure out how to crack the nut on how do we move forward anyway. And so we've got a lot of work and uh, surprisingly, um, a lot of leaders who are, uh, are putting money where their mouth is in terms of figuring out how we do, how different ways that we can do IT in the Space Force in order to be able to gather those IT billets back out of the traditional base comm squadrons and stand up cyber squadrons. And so, um, so a lot of work being done, being done there. And that's probably one of, our, one of our key focuses. The Space Force also has the benefit of being exceptionally mission aligned. So our deltas, the Space Force deltas are all aligned around space, comp or, uh, space capabilities. So every delta represents a capability. EW or SATCOM or space domain awareness, et cetera, right? And so we're aligning our cyber defense capabilities around those space capabilities. And so what we what we preach and the and the 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 model that we're using is uh, cyber integrated space operations. And so our defenders sit on the floor with space operators. Uh, they're very tuned in to those space mission systems and weapon systems understanding what they look like, what right looks like, what baseline looks like, and what's not normal. And so that's the model that we're pursuing. Uh, our big challenge is we've been obviously making these promises to, uh, to folks who've been coming over to the Space Force, you know, from the Air Force and from other services, that this is the path forward. And so we're working hard to try to live up to those promises. We've, we've had some uh, great recruiting uh, efforts and opportunities more people applying than we have uh, billets for, and we've been able to basically pick the cream of the crop. And uh, so now trying to hold true to those promises so that we can retain those people is, is key for us. Okay, working, all right. Uh, all right, Lieutenant Colonel Todd Arnold talking about the uh, Army. So General Kraft gave you a little bit of an overview this morning on it, where only our branch is only seven and a half years old. Uh, and a lot of changes in those seven and a half years. Uh, so we first started with like a career field for each of the officer warrant and enlisted MOSs. And quickly after, well, it was just five years ago, so the branch is only two years old. We incorporated all the cyber, uh, el the electromagnetic, the EW type folks. Uh, they were a former functional area. They got absorbed into the cyber branch. So we created another career path inside of uh, cyber. So we expanded to five. Uh, and then just recently in the last year, we've uh, expanded to have the developer MOSs. So they're the ones that write and create all those capabilities. And that created another uh, career path for officers and warrant officers. And so now all of our like offensive and defensive, the traditional CMF folks fall into the 17 alpha category or the alpha category, that's the first MOS. Then we have 17 Bravos for the, for the uh, officers is where the EW folks go and then uh, 17 deltas for our developers. We have the equivalents for our, all of our uh, warrant officers as well, uh, same things. And then we have the 17 Charlie for the enlisted MOS, which is wh where every, everybody goes for the uh, enlisted folks in the offensive and defensive categories. And then we have a 17 Echo for our electronic warfare uh, enlisted personnel. Now, what uh, we have about 3,200 folks on active duty. I know uh, Colonel General Kraft said it was about 5,800 or 5,900 folks through the uh, active guard and reserve component. 3,200 approximately are uh, active duty. Uh, it's almost even evenly split. We have about uh, about 1,800 enlisted, and it's around 900 officers and uh, 500 warrant officers. 
So it's pretty pretty heavy on the officer and warrant officer side compared to a lot of the other branches. And some of that is tied to some of those talent man management issues that the, that the, everybody's been talking about and hitting on. Uh, for example, in the developer MOS, uh, we've created a one of the work roles that we can define and everything in, inside of cyber is that developer develop, developer work role and so we've created an entire MOS for that so you can code and write capabilities for your entire career. But we've made it so that like you can bounce back and forth between Alpha Bravo and Delta, whatever it happens to be for the uh, off for the officers and warrant officers if they choose to do that. But you have one area that you primarily focus in. Uh, one of the reasons why we, if you notice there was only two, you know, we have three kind of career paths, dedicated career paths, only two for the enlisted folks. And that's partially because of talent management. Uh, we get some of the most educated, uh, we have the smartest enlisted cohort, probably in the entire army. We have more people with at least some college background and a lot more with college degrees than any of the other uh, branches inside of the uh, army. And one of the problems with that is it's very difficult to retain them. And when we were creating the developer career field, especially with those, they can probably add on at least 100 grand to their salary if they're good at writing some of this code and walk out. Uh, so what we wanted to do was get more and more of them into the uh, warrant officer path. So there's a small number of de developers that are on the enlisted side, and we're trying to rapidly get them into the warrant officer path as quickly as possible. Or they can also go, go officer for the developers because we also have a direct commissioning program. So we're bringing folks in from the outside, direct commissioning them uh, in, into the officer corps, uh, depending on their civilian work experience and stuff like that. But it's also working for some of our uh, enlisted personnel. One of my former soldiers actually just came in as an E7 and he's gonna be like a mid-grade captain, for, for example, with the direct commissioning program. Uh, so those are kind of our biggest uh, changes and advancements in the last five years. Uh, Tony Siciliano with uh, the Marine Corps, Mar4 Cyber. Um, I believe the question before was, you know, do I work in the in the cyber? I am a cyber officer, uh, and the um, the job that I'll be going to this summer will be part of that job. Will be managing the OC field, so kind of both. Um, in 2017, uh, we stood up our 1700 uh, OC field to um, to answer the the readiness issues that we were having with uh, with cyber. Prior to that, uh, we had uh, communications officers, our 06 field, uh, some intelligence officers from our 02 field, and, and SIGINT officers, our SIGINT Marines from our 2600 field, filling a lot of those work roles, um, which led to um, problems with uh, professionalization. Um, a communications officer would come in, do a, C, a tour with a CPT, go back to doing communications officer work. So there's not a lot of uh, return on investment for that long training pipeline. So again, in 2017, we stood up the 17 Oc field, uh, a lot of lat moves uh, to bring that in. So we, we uh, built that uh, Oc field from the, uh, from the bottom up. Um, we have the uh, traditional kind of regular officer, um, what we call unrestricted officers. Um, we have warrant officers and limited duty officers, similar to the way the Navy has LDOs, and then obviously a, a large enlisted corps. Um, right now that, uh, when fully manned, that'll probably be around 2,400 uh, Marines. Um, we fill all the work roles uh, through in the CMF, CMF uh, that we need for the CPT, CMT, CSDs. Uh, and we also have um, a requirement for the fleet as well. We uh, recently stood up uh, DCO IDM companies at each MEF. Um, so those are filled with 17s and uh, as well as throughout the MEFs and especially in the MEF information groups, uh, there are 17s uh, there as well. Uh, big, biggest change in our, uh, in our OC field uh, of late was um, we were recently, the cyber OC field was recently redesignated as the information maneuver OC field, and that incorporates uh, space information operations. Um, and I believe I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, so I'll, I'll save that. Good morning. Uh, Carlos Alford, again, he uh, already said I'm a uh, commander of the 89th Airlift Support Group and a uh, former career field manager, so I am a, a, a cyber warfare operations officer uh, by trade. Um, for our career field, uh, I'm proud to say you know, we uh, stood up the uh, cyber operations career field, I think, back in 2008, 2009-ish, and uh, kind of ahead of our time. 
um, but that was also a tumultuous time in our Air Force, you know, so associated with nuclear weapons. So, uh, but still to that end, we continue to produce cyber officers based on uh, uh, the need and, and that the requirement that we uh, saw. Uh, but along the along the uh, along that path, we didn't realize some of the uh, gains from things like it's now called ITAS, but um, divesting some of the IT work at the base. But we continue to produce cyber officers, and over that period. We were producing cyber officers, but still sending them out to uh, base level uh, with uh, very little uh, IT focused experience. So that caused some challenges uh, over time. And so what we ended up doing is um, we, we took in some studies from RAND and uh, other, uh, other feedback from the career field. And uh, as recently as uh, 2019, uh, we took a hard look at that and, and uh, divided, if you will, not divided, but uh, certainly broke the career field down uh, into uh, several AFSCs or four AFSCs. Uh, uh, Cyber Effects Operations 17S, uh, the set up by defense and offensive uh, operations, and then Warfighting Communications uh, 17D, um, where we have uh, expeditionary communications and, and network operations. And, and that was, again, based on uh, a lot of feedback at that at that time. We also wanted to do a developer career field, but we didn't have all the billets identified to be able to do that. You kind of need to know what the requirements are. And it was less than a hundred that we could find on the books. Doesn't mean folks weren't doing it. We just couldn't find them. And so we couldn't uh, make that into its own uh, specialty. And so since then, uh, the schoolhouse down at Keesler, the 333rd uh, training squadron, uh, they've retooled the, the uh, schoolhouse to, to focus on, on cyber effects operations as, as a track and warfighting communications as a track. And, and so we think that's going to uh, put us in the, uh, uh, take us in the right directions for supporting the cyber mission force, as well as supporting some of the uh, service retained requirements uh, that, we ha that we have. And that career field now is uh, made up of uh, uh, for the officers is made up of primarily uh, about 2,800, 2,800 to 3,000 uh, cyber warfare operations officers, which covers uh, both specialties. Uh, one Bravos, which are cyber effects on the enlisted side, and it's about 1,000 people. And then we still have upwards of 18,000 uh, folks still doing traditional IT uh, work that has recently transformed into a 1D7, um, which they're on a journey uh, to focus on cybersecurity and cyber defense. Uh, as service retained uh, 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 personnel, and uh, you know, far as uh, you know, where where we're headed, still trying to uh, meet the requirements of the uh, of the of the cyber mission force, and then the mission defense uh, for our major weapon systems. So, as recently as um, in the last uh, thirty to forty five days, uh, we have uh, designated the Air Force has des designated nineteen mission defense teams. They call them prime mission defense teams. And they're aligned uh, to a major weapon system. In our case, I'm fortunate enough where they aligned a mission defense team to our uh, VIP, a special airlift mission. So we have an MDT within my group um, and focused on, uh, focused on that. So they're one of three in their mobility command. And again, one of the uh, 19 that we have uh, within the Air Force. And so the Air Force is looking to man, man and equip those and get those trained and ready to, to primarily focus on, on weapon systems while we have a whole nother cadre that's aligned to um, um, Cyber Command and focused on that. Will Terrell, uh, former officer community manager for our cyber communities. Uh, I'm a cryptologic warfare officer by trade and cyber is one of our core competencies. Uh, so the Navy doesn't have a specific cyberspace operations officer in the, the sense that the other services have. Uh, we've invested our cyber capabilities across a multitude of designators, our information professionals, uh, and their enlisted counterparts, the ITs, cryptologic warfare, and our CTN counterparts on the enlisted side, and then our warrant officers uh, on CW, as well as our cyber warrant officers, and then our career field, uh, cyber warfare engineer. Um, so uh, that's, that's how the Navy treats cyber, uh, and you'll get different flavors of individuals and different uh, kind of job specialties and subspecialties within those uh, career fields, those designators. Um, I'd like to talk uh, for a minute on, the, on the, the newest developments that we've had over the last uh, few years, uh, both our cyber warrants and our cyber warfare engineers. 
Uh, both of them were created about a decade, 10 to 12 years ago. Uh, but there has been a lot of uh, developments uh, in just the last couple of years when uh, I was down to Bureau of Naval Personnel. Uh, the first on the cyber warrants, uh, they were a traditional warrant officer community uh, born out of the CTNs, uh, the keyboard operators, ions. Um, and then uh, to expand that career field and to, uh, to help retain uh, some of the, that talent, uh, the Navy decided to, to reinvigorate the warrant officer one program uh, so while we still assess uh, cyber warrants uh, and they can, they, can, uh, they can be more senior, uh, they can be as junior as an E5 with six years of experience as long as they're ION certified and they can, be, uh, they can apply for the cyber warrant officer program. Uh, our cyber war for engineers around the, the same time frame, uh, there were some uh, developments there. It had been, it was kind of an interesting uh, niche field. Uh, officers would be assessed uh, through our, our officer development school, ODS, uh, specifically, there was no accession pathway through uh, traditional lat transfer, ROTC, or the academy. And uh, they would spend a maximum of five years as a cyber warfare engineer, our capabilities developers. And then they were expected to either leave the service or transition to be a cryptologic warfare or information professional uh, officer. Uh, and they would top out at 03. So developments there. Uh, the Navy expanded that career field now so that uh, that designator goes all the way to 06. As Captain Carolyn's our, our second uh, CWE captain. Uh, and and we, uh, the career field's still small, so we only have one. So right now that's uh, Captain Carolyn. But, but uh, we're growing, um, and I would expect that career field to continue to grow um, as, the, as the requirements uh, increase. Uh, so those are two things uh, in terms of retention and the ability to... Uh, uh, to help us get hard to find talent. Uh, the Navy has, is taking advantage of, of constructed service credit. That was a NDAA, uh, National Defense Authorization Act uh, authority that was granted to the services. So uh, on the books, the Navy could assess up to an 06, up to a Navy captain, if they had the right uh, background and skill sets uh, and experience necessary to meet those requirements. Um, for cyber work for engineer. And that's the, uh, the only cyber community that uh, we are currently uh, using that authority for. Um, but that's uh, cyber warfare uh, and cyber uh, ops in kind of a nutshell for the Navy. Perfect. Thank you, panelists. So uh, for the audience, what you've heard so far, if you've got questions, you can go ahead and ask them. Otherwise, I'll go out. Got one already. Go ahead. Question or that'll work too. Sir, uh, thank you. So I'm with the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering Office, and I'm running a congressional program to help increase the quality and quantity of ROTC and DOD minded civilians that can enter into your career fields. The stories that I'm hearing when I'm working with the 20 universities that are currently uh, receiving funding and uh, we're helping to work with them and their, um, their curriculum to develop it is that many of the ROTC students in years three and in years four are not making it to their uh, intended MOS or career field uh, for a variety of reasons, either because they're not, um, they're not being identified as being especially invested in, or, or here's the other one. And this is where I think the question comes, please. And if you could help me out here, I'm hearing that they're actually, they're deciding to go into industry or elsewhere because they feel that as a junior officer, they're not gonna be able to do anything technical or hands-on. But I'm kind of hearing hints that maybe that's not necessarily the case either. So I'm wondering what your perspective is because I would love to message them both as they enter into the university um, pipeline and through the university pipeline that there are these opportunities and that they can make a difference to apply their technical education. Your thoughts on this, please? Great question. Thanks. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, that's uh, that's something the Navy's taken a hard look at over the last couple of years on the on the uh, my Navy HR side uh, of the house. Uh, and over the last three years, uh, we introduced the ability to uh, select directly as a cyber warfare engineer uh, through the academy and ROTC. Up until you know two three years ago, that was not the case. Um, and then we've also expanded the opportunities for cryptologic warfare as well. Um, so. 
there is opportunity. I will caveat that by they are small opportunities and they're really based upon the size of the communities, cryptologic warfare is fairly small Navy wise, cyber warfare engineer, very small. Um, and then also, uh, you know, the, the general purpose for ROTC and as well as the academy is to produce uh, what we consider unrestricted line officers or, you know, combat arms type uh, type uh, designators. Uh, but we have been we have made inroads and we have, uh, you know, been able to uh, select people out of ROTC directly uh, for those cyber fields. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, certain that we don't have enough uh, uh, technical folks, uh, you know, operating in our uh, career field right now. We we certainly need them. I don't know all the formulas involved with the sessions and the decisions they they make, um, you know, out of the service academies. Of course, we're trying to produce pilots as well, so we're competing with that. So folks that may be technically adept at this may also have chosen pilots, and so there's a percentage of those uh, graduates. But we have the opportunities and. Right now, if they select uh, 17, they'll end up at uh, Keesler. And uh, based on some additional uh, aptitude testing, uh, they will be tracked towards, there's also preferences, but if they cho choose it, they will track towards 17S or cyber effects operations. And there are, uh, there are plenty of opportunities on, on our end. So um, I don't know where the messaging is uh, going wrong. And the goal and why we did this, this the uh, AFSC breakdown is so that folks could say technical longer, you know, for the first seven to you know eight years at least, and and, and then and then be leaders in those units that are primarily uh, a technical and typically right now in the cyber mission force. But also, as I said, we're retooling our schoolhouse because we need uh, Doden operators just as smart, right, uh, doing cybersecurity. Yeah, very very similar to to what you said. You know, being the smallest service we have. Uh, smaller opportunities for that. So as we get um, midshipmen that go Marine option, come out of the academy and, and other uh, um, uh, officers uh, that commission from technical backgrounds, technical education backgrounds, um, those opportunities do exist. Um, when, they, uh, when they commission and then go to the basic school, um, those officers, those second lieutenants who uh, have been identified as going into the cyber. They, they try to track that towards cyber, but it is a needs of the Marine Corps. Um, I, I think probably everybody will, will echo that as well. So, um, but there is an opportunity for, for that to get identified early. Um, and then again, similar to what the Colonel said, um, in those early first years, that's, that's the, the young Lieutenant and the young captain's opportunity to get technical but they're not gonna stay technical. Um, they're unrestricted officers who are being uh, groomed for uh, later, you know, for leadership opportunities later in their career. So what we, uh, what we are really working hard to do within our occupation field is ensure that these, these officers get uh, a depth tour and a broadening tour. Um, and there needs to be that, that back and forth. Um, and uh, in early in their career, they, they may not get that depth tour first. They may get that broadening tour uh, out in the, in the uh, FMF uh, doing one of the service retain workforce uh, work roles. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that we're uh, mindful of and, and working, working hard with our uh, manpower folks. So I think we, in the Army, we have kind of more of those opportunities for the junior officers to go and do more technical things, especially because we just made the 17 Delta the developer. So if you're interested in doing that, that is great. Uh, one of the big questions though, our big concerns is like the, the branching process. It's very challenging. You said they identified they want to go, but they may not make it into like the cyber branch, right? And, you know, when we first set up the cyber branch, we're like, it'd be great if we could at least have enough qualified candidates or more qualified candidates than there are positions. And we have, it is, now extremely, extremely competitive for on the academy and ROTC to get the cyber branch, right? People are willing to give, give their additional service obligations in order to get into the cyber branch. And I had, just looking at the ones that got, got it from West Point this year, the vast majority of them, I think there's only like three or four did not have a STEM degree. Uh, most of them had an E or CS degree. And so it's not that we're like missing them. It's just extremely competitive, which is a good problem to have, right? So uh, I'd say, and I'd encourage them to apply and try to try to get it, uh, but don't be discouraged if you don't get it right away. 
and even like some of the cadets, like I'm, I'm at mentor at the academy and, and talk to you, like we, we don't always do a good job in the service of saying like your first job isn't going to be your only job and that's all you're going to be the entire time you're in the army, right? I'm technically on my, my fourth MOS now, right? My full fourth one, right? And, uh, but, and because uh, because I, I actually just switched over to 17 Delta, right? So I actually fifth now. Anyway, yeah, so you, it's it, just because you'd sign up for like, say you want to go, like say one of my best cadets wanted to go infantry and he's like, maybe I'll come back over into cyber later. There are those opportunities starting around years two, three, four, five, uh, you can start doing, doing those things. Uh, yeah, so we have a lot of those opportunities. And even if you don't go Delta, you're going uh, Bravo for electronic warfare, a lot of hands-on what we're redoing and reassessing the education and the training and everything for them to get them a bit more technical too. So it's not just pushing a button or something like that on the capabilities, they know more about it. And 17 alphas, they're gonna, they're gonna do some of the leadership positions, that, that's where the leadership positions are, but in there, there's a ton of technical uh, work roles inside of the cyber mission forces that they will do those and leadership and then they can bounce back and forth inside of the 17 alpha field. So I, I think a quick correction. Uh, I think the Space Force is now the smallest service. I mentioned that though because uh, a couple of things that we I mentioned earlier were the uh, sort of over the course of the over the course of the FIDEP, our intent is to divest ourselves of uh, having guardians doing IT work have those billets fully shifted over to doing uh, cyber defense work inside the Space Force aligned with the Deltas. So um, anybody coming into the Space Force then that we're assessing will have the opportunity to do, to, to be technical, right? And along those same lines, shifting a lot of those leadership roles to the right in somebody's career so they have more time to grow technically before they step into those um, flight command and, and ops leadership type of roles because we wanna build depth of capability, we want to build specialization. So second thing, because the career, because space is as small as it is and the cyber career fields inside space are very small, particularly on the officer side where you're talking about, um, we know everybody. Like at my rank, like we know everybody that we assess. Everybody has a senior mentor. Um, there's nobody that gets lost in the wash because through the through the big grind of the big service. It's a small service. It's a small career field inside the service, and so everybody's career everybody's career fields and paths are rather hand managed. Um, so you can't really hide in the space force um, if you're trying to hide. But if you want to exceed, you get a lot of help uh, exceeding as well. Uh, the I'd say the other thing, um, we're, still, we're still working at growing, well, so here, here's the other key piece. Uh, so the Space Force sees itself as totally operating inside of cyber, and General Saltzman, the Chief of Operations, will say that. One of the things that's been interesting about working for him is st and standing up cyber inside the Space Force is he, he says, ops is ops is ops. There's only four career fields in the Space Force on the officer side. There's space, oper there's space, uh, the space operators, cyber operators, intelligence officers and 62Es, engineers. That's it, four career fields. And he considers space, cyber, and intel as just ops. That's it. So what does that mean? That means over the course of career progression, we have a cyber delta. Delta six is the cyber delta. But the senior leadership on the, the space operators and the senior leadership do not see cyber officers as just being pinned to lead inside of delta six. They see them leading Delta-8, the SATCOM Delta, Delta-4, Delta-3, the EW Delta, right? There's all these other potentials and opportunity. The way they really see it is, where are you growing up in ops? Like, do you have space, you know, do you have experience doing cyber defense for space CW, right? Or for space domain awareness or for SATCOM or for whatever. Like, where, where are you growing your experience at? and building your eligibility from there. So by the time you reach 06 ranks, you could be commanding uh, something that would have traditionally only been a, a 13 Sierra or has been a traditionally been a 13 Sierra because of their view that ops is ops is ops, whether or not you're talking about space or cyber intelligence. So I think a lot of great opportunity for folks coming in. I think it's, it, like I said, it's exciting. Um, 
on the Space Force side. And what we're working hard at doing is taking all those plans that we have, those promises that we've made and, and uh, putting a lot of money and effort at, at coming good on them. All right, so um, we definitely want uh, junior officers with technical background. And uh, this year we actually stood up the direct commission cyber officer program just to fill that niche within the Coast Guard. Um, we previously had the direct, we still have the direct uh, commission uh, engineer program, but those mainly go to naval engineers and you know the IT folks. But uh, we re realized there's a uh, deficit in our a junior officer workforce and we stood up the program and I think our first panel actually met last month. I'm very interested in seeing the results and the caliber of folks that, you know, going to be getting their commission. Um, one thing that, you know, panel member here mentioned, you know, yes, we want you to stay technical, but unfortunately, we also want to groom you to be a leader. Right, so you're going to get that broadening tour where you're going to unfortunately have to step away from your comfort zone and be not as technical and start leading people. But we also want to give you an opportunity to go back into the technical field within CG Cyber and be a CPT lead so that you've had the experience, but now you can manage the team when you're going out on mission. Right, so that's our goal with that uh, DCCO program. And you know, I'm, I'm hoping we gain success because they're going to be our future leaders. And if we're not able to keep them on mission, it's going to be very difficult to retain them. And, get, you know, and then, you know, working with their peers, they can see what's available out there. And it's really our job to make sure that um, job, that satisfaction and their career progression and that we look out for them. Thanks for your right here. Question. Sure. Well, repeat the question. So, yeah, so uh, I think the question is, where do you see our reserve forces integrate with our active duty forces, right? So um, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because CG Cyber and our program office, we're really working towards establishing what it looks like to be a career uh, reserve officer and enlisted workforce, right? So at the operational commands at the sector districts and areas, we're looking into doing our concept of operations having a senior reserve officer that's cyber, right? So that they can provide the operational commanders the background and knowledge and experience of what operations and cyber can influence operations. We're also looking into standing up uh, CPTs that can augment the reserve CPT that can augment our active duty CPTs, right? So what's difficult with that is we're trying to stand up a reserve force that may or may not have the pipeline training that's required, right? So probably the first couple of years, we're gonna be able to take our active duty personnel that decide, hey, I wanna go reserve and I wanna also go into industry. We might be able to send them in as part of that reserve workforce so that when we uh, start deploying our CPTs and we're trying to balance leave and mission requirement, we can start augmenting the reserve force and bringing them in, in on mission. Um, we're, um, actively trying to gain and move empty reserve billets into that reserve construct within CG Cyber, and then hopefully also integrate them into uh, US Cyber Command as part of our effort. Yeah, so the Space Force doesn't have reserve Space Force at this point in time, right? It's still uh, folks, it's still Air Force reservists. What I'll tell you is uh, the Space Force is trying to approach it from a, from a different angle. What they're wanting to create is a porous force um in general right uh so we're working through our s1 is working through what are the what are the legal and policy things that have to happen in order to get there uh, but the intent is is that you can flow from being uh what you'd consider part-time or full-time or uh taking a hiatus and then uh and then coming back into the service um to try to make that uh to try to make the service fit people's lives and what they want to do as effectively as possible. And so uh, there's a, a, lot of, a lot of work going on right now looking uh, through, from the S1, looking at, well, what would that look like? And then, of course, the same way, what does that allow us to do for things like cyber and being able to flexibly bring people in, right? Allow them to, 
take time to get a degree or go teach at a university or uh, allow them to uh, go into industry and then float back in to the service or come back in part-time into the service. So allowing multiple options and paths for people to be able to do that is really the focus that the Space Force has right now. That's one of the challenges that the S-1 is working. That's why you haven't seen a stand up uh, space reserve uh, space reserve units and, and just and, and or cut over the Air Force Reserve units. Yeah, so the Army has, uh, I believe it's 10 teams in the Guard and, or more than 10 teams and then 10 in the Reserve as well. Uh, so right now it's primarily defensive focused uh, and they're building out those teams and trying to work on it. And that gives us part of our workforce and ability and a place for them to go, go in like when they leave the service. Uh, but I know there's people actively working for the reserves, trying to expand some of the uh, capabilities and billets so that we might actually have offensive teams or at least billets where some people that are coming off the offensive teams can land. Uh, I just found out yesterday that there's, there is a program for some of those folks. Like if you're more senior qualified in some of the, uh, the less dense work roles, the ones that we're really needing, like say you're an ion, an active, on that active operator that's leaving the service, you're a little more senior, like we can, fast track you into one of those reserve spots uh, if you still want to go. One of our big problems though is like when people are leaving, they're like, and I'm done, right? So <laughs> yeah, so we've, we've got to fix kind of that problem a little bit too, and then also have a, a place for them to land. So I, I know people are actively working on that. Yeah, the, uh, the reserves are a, a integral part of, you know, what we do for, for talent management. Um, and I say that um, we, we have two DCO IDM, reserve DCO IDM units. Um, and we have the, the way we use our reservists more often or, or mostly is through the, uh, the IMA process, the individual mobilization augmentation. So uh, what we do is we bring, uh, we bring these guys on board for either you know, 30 days or up to a year sometimes. Um, and leverage their experience, their previous you know, active duty military experience, the experience that they've gained working in industry and bring that back on board uh, to, to fill those key critical gaps that we have. Um, but it's, uh, it's definitely something that we're, we're working on to try to expand, um, yeah. Yeah, we're pretty, pretty similar in, uh, in that regard. You know, we continue to uh, integrate and normally through an IMA uh, trying to gain both that expertise from their uh, previous uh, experience in the military and and what they're getting from industry. And um, I know that we have uh, at least one uh, reserve cyber wing, and um, I know that we're standing up another one. So we continue to, to use that capability. It's part of, you know, it's, it's embedded in what, what we do, trying to take advantage of of talent and then some things are strategic in place, obviously, you know, not just reserve, but guard. If we have a guard unit in Redmond, Washington, I assure you that we're probably leveraging a lot of talent from Microsoft uh, day job folks, you know, working and trying to take advantage of that and, and bringing it to bear in our overall uh, uh, force. And as well as um, our active duty uh, development team chair responsible for developing cyber office, he's part of the reserve development team also to bring some of that knowledge uh, to that force as well. Yeah, for the on the Navy side, the for the information professionals and C and the uh, the CWs, the cryptological warfare, it's fairly routine. There's a robust presence on the reserve side, and uh, those people that uh, those individuals that want to uh, continue working a cyber aligned mission would seek to drill at those Navy reserve units that that are aligned to that mission. Uh, for the smaller communities of cyber warfare engineer, and then for the for the specialty of the the cyber warrants. Uh, there's not been a critical mass of their super small communities in the active duty side already. It's not been a, a critical mass of those bullets on the reserve side. Uh, so individuals that wish to transition to the reserve have usually transitioned uh, to uh, certainly on the officer side, at least to a uh, cryptologic warfare or information professional. And we do have a couple of former cyber warfare engineers that are they're they're still cyber warfare engineers. They, they still have that background, but but officially they're cryptologic warfare reserves. Um, so that's how the Navy has sliced that. So I'll, I'll add to the Navy piece too, and we'll not be aware of this because it just, just happened last month. We made an official request to stand up the Cyber Warfare Engineer Reserve Community. We requested 50 billets to make that happen. So fingers crossed. I saw another hand over here earlier. Go ahead.
So let me repeat the question. The question is about, as we heard uh, Chris Cleary, Cleary talk about this morning and adamantly state that he believes you'd have a, a U.S. cyber force. Um, if that were to happen, uh, you know, for our service representatives here, how how is that going to impact how we're currently doing cyber uh, in our services? Is that correct question? Right. So this is a, it, you know, we're looking at protecting the marine critical infrastructure with on the physical domain and now in the cyber domain. So if a cyber force stands up, I would be very curious on how the Coast Guard can continue our statutory mission to protect that domain. And right now it's on a solely voluntary basis. We have our CPTs going on scene at the request of our uh, marine uh, or partners to assess their network and potentially help them harden the network, right? So uh, I, I would be interested in seeing how, if that cyber force does stand up, what each of the service components are having to give up as far as people, people, right? Because that's the most valuable resource and we're just having trouble trying to fill our own, right? So I just wanted to highlight that. All right, uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Over here. First Lieutenant Sarah Lovell here with the Maryland Air National Guard. I'd be interested in each of your arguments for why your service branch presents the best opportunities for women in cyber. Thank you. Who wants to go first on that one? <laughs> so I want to highlight that Admiral Fagan is going to be our commandant. All right. And, and we are really excited that, uh, you know, she's going to be the commandant. 
I haven't heard all of the uh, workforce discussions that's happening at the high level, but I think a lot of great things are gonna be happening. We've had a lot of initiatives for focus on retention of the workforce and focused on our uh, that particular demographic, right? And my a classmate of mine, she works in the you know um, HR branch of Coast Guard headquarters. We've done a lot of initiatives to just level set in the Coast Guard's uh, parity to industry. And I think we are really set to recruit and retain the the workforce. So you know that that's that's my one really big plug for uh, you know for you. Side. Yeah, I don't know. It just keeps. It, oh, there it goes again. I, I talk. For women, but for anybody meeting the needs of, of, um, of any of our service members, but it does allow for the same kind of thing, right? So um, life situation, starting a family, whatever the case may be, to allow some people to step out of the service, do what they need to do outside of the service, spend that time they need to, and then be able to step back into the service without having to make a choice of whether or not, you know, whether or not I have to separate for good or, or not, so. I don't know about cyber specifically, but I know the army is doing some of the some of the same things. Uh, not quite the porous force, which is something really exciting. Uh, I hope that works out for you guys, so we can start copying it. Uh, but uh, the army just released recently new guidance and uh, regulations for uh, in, in support of people that have families, right? And so, like, regardless, it used to be like mission, mission, mission. Like, no, we need to take care of the people that are choosing to have families more and give them some more leave and it's a lot more liberal in it now and like it it's kind of forcing some of the commanders and people in charge that maybe not have given that consideration before like no you have to do some of these things so we're, we're taking steps it's, it's slow but it is making progress uh, similarly So, um, but, you know, throughout the, uh, the history of Marine Forces Cyberspace Command, um, you know, Lieutenant General retired Lori Reynolds was, was our commander, and, and I, I had known her for, for many years through, throughout both of our careers. Um, you know, extremely intelligent, um, extremely driven um, and visionary. Um, and throughout our cyber force, um, the, uh, what, what has stood out to me is um, that the, there, there is no work role um, or position uh, that uh, is exclusive of, of, of any gender or, or persuasion. And it's um, the, the absolute, some, some of the, the finest officers and Marines um, that have you know, worked in some of the most trying and um, uh, technically challenging positions have, have been female. So a couple of them are here today. Uh, so it's, um, I think it's a testament to how we have been able to operate uh, over the last few years. Uh, cyber specific, I think we're, we're doing well. Of course, I think we can all do better. Um, our uh, only 07 uh, selectee uh, this, this past uh, cycle was, was a female, uh, Heather Blackwell. She's the Air Combat Command uh, uh, A6 at this time. And we were fortunate when I was the career field manager, we were fortunate to be the first uh, non 
uh, rated career field to be able to brief the chief of staff on what we were doing for demographics or what, what we were doing for diversity. And um, it, it turned out we were doing well. And the question became, what are we doing specifically? But, but we weren't, we were just taking care of the force. And so we, I think it's built into what we're doing, but what we really noticed doing the research, we're taking care of who comes in, but if we want more, we need to have a bigger pool far left, right? And that goes beyond uh, college and it goes beyond high school. It starts further left than that. And that's something that we've got to look at as a nation. I think most people are aware less than 1% of the population is able to serve or some number like that. So that's what we're working with. So we, we're challenged far left, but I think we're doing pretty good with what we get, but we can do better and make sure there are no perceived limitations. Some of which like Joe, uh, Wingo mentioned and in, in being able to take care of, uh, you're able to have a family and serve um, because one thing I'll, I'll say it, um, you know, one thing I do notice as I have uh, before in a job where I've managed uh, 06s and, and general officers, I will say females tend to not have family sometime when they're at, at this level. And that concerns me. I know it's a choice, but, but why did they make that choice? Um, you know, those are questions that may need to be asked. And I'm also proud to say, we, we are having, um, you know, one of our, not our first, but coming this year, uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, Lauren Corshane, she's currently a group commander, a cyber group commander, and she's going to go lead the 37 training wing. And for, for us, that's the uh, gateway to the Air Force where it takes over basic military training. And so that's a significant opportunity for anyone, but certainly one of our females in the cyber career field being able to have that opportunity. I would say on the Navy side for, for both cyber and more broadly information warfare, I think we have a, we have a good story to tell there. Uh, as all the services do, we study our demographics as well. And, and uh, certainly uh, from my vantage point down in Tennessee, we were roughly the Navy, the, the nation, national average in terms of demographics, men and women. Uh, and that was throughout the, the career field. Uh, and so I think that, that speaks to the value added proposition that the Navy career paths can offer an individual. Uh, so that you know, choices that have been mentioned before aren't necessarily exclusive, but they're more inclusive. And so I think if you look at our, at our senior leadership, while I agree with uh, my counterpart here that it, it is, uh, if you're looking at the service today at a very senior level, you're really looking back in time, kind of like the Hubble telescope. Um, so you have to start way left. If you want to change something now, you're really starting at, at boot camp, at OCS, ROTC, uh, and so those selections are going to impact later down the road. But if you look at just today, um, I think we still fare very well. Uh, our information warfare boss, uh, Vice Admiral Ashback, um, Intel officer by trade, but more broadly information warfare. Uh, we had Vice Admiral Ty, who was both our Navy staff in two and six, but also a leader, uh, commander of 10th Fleet. Um, and then uh, Rear Admiral Burke, uh, Cyber Command J5. So. I think we have a, a, a healthy representation at the more senior levels. Uh, and I, I would anticipate that just uh, stays the course and improves. And I'd just like to add, um, just I, I left out our A26 uh, is a three-star female, our CIO, uh, three-star equivalent, uh, you know, female. Uh, so I, I, again, the, the examples are at the top and a lot of times that's what people need to see to know they can be there as well. And I think uh, most folks realize that. All right, well, I think we are now out of time, unfortunately, I know there's a lot more we can talk about, but I'm glad we got to answer uh, some of the things that were on your mind in the audience. And uh, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists for being here.